This is an interview for Purdue University's oral history program. Today's date is August 27, 2013. Today I'm interviewing a member of Purdue's class of 1953, Mr. Paul Petty. Also with us is Rita Baines, Director of Development Communications, Purdue School of Aeronautics and Astronautics, and my name is Tracy Grimm. I'm the Baron Hilton Archivist for Flight and Space Exploration at Purdue University Libraries Archives and Special Collections. Welcome, Mr. Petty. Thank you so much for coming here to talk with us today. And Rita, thank you for joining us. Um, Mr. Petty, I'd like to start by asking you a few questions about your childhood. So could you tell us uh, where you were born and what it was like growing up? I was born on a farm in southern Indiana. Uh, and I'm, I'm a Depression kid. You know, I was born in 27, and so uh, the 30s were, I don't know what you would say as a time. I, we never really ever uh, wanted for anything, but we didn't have anything to spare either. Mm -hmm. But uh, being on a farm was nice. We grew a lot of the food we ate. And there were four of us, kids that is, all still alive. Um, and in essence, we had a good time. <laughs> what what city or town, where, where was it? It was in, in Davis County, uh, north of Washington, but the school I went to was El Loma. Mm -hmm. And uh, not a large school. And uh, when I, you know, of course I did well in school. Uh, I was president of my class, which was not big, for four years running. <laughs> no. <laughs> there, there were 19 of us. And Every one of the boys, and, and most of the girls, every one of the boys went to college. Wow. And uh, so, when, when I, I left to go in the Navy, and which sent me to, to schools, uh, I was always, I wondered and I was scared how 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 is a kid from a po little podunk school going to ever match up with these high school kids from Indianapolis and Cleveland and what have you? Turned out it didn't make any difference. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was what you did, not uh -huh. where you went to school. Right, and how hard you worked. Right? And how hard you worked at it, see. but. Uh, I went through high school. I never ever took a book home or did any homework at home. Wow. You know, it just I could do it all during the day and got it all done. And then during the war, of course I was there then in high school during the war and the high school was shortened uh, to uh, mid-April so that we could go work on the farm. So, and that's what we did. Uh, but I got a good education, believe it or not. I had, I had a couple of great teachers. Mm -hmm. And no regrets. You know, it was, it was a strict life. We worked. Uh, my brother and I had specific things that we had to do, and nobody did them for you. If you came home at 10 o'clock at night on a cold, windy day, your your chores were still waiting for you. So, it was a good lesson. Huh? Yeah. So we learned how to do things. But I had no desire to stay on the farm. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that when I 
graduated, I was going to do something else. And I was fortunate to get into a, uh, the Navy Holloway program. Uh, and I'll tell you even a funnier story. When, when my dad took me to sign up for the last time and I had to take a physical, uh, I, was, uh, I was below the weight limit. So the seaman who was running the test said, uh, I said, well, what do I do now? Because he said, you, you, you flunk because you don't weigh enough. <laughs> and, and he said, tell your dad to take you down to the corner store and buy a bunch of bananas. And I said, what the hell is that going to do for yeah. me? And he said, for Christ's sake, eat them. <laughs> <laughs> so I went down to the, that's exactly what we did. I went down to the store. My dad bought a bunch of bananas. I sat there and ate bananas, and I went back and took the test, and I passed. <laughs> and that's how I got in the Navy. <laughs> Is that a true story? <laughs> <laughs> it's really... That's funny. But I, I was, I did. You know, I, when when he said that, I thought, "What the hell is he talking about?" <laughs> so, have you eaten bananas since then? <laughs> oh yeah, I've eaten bananas. <laughs> but uh, so I went into the Holloway program. So was that at Purdue, or you went straight into no, that, the Navy, and then I was I was uh, the the program was a, was an eight year program, hmm. and. I don't think my father was, he, th he thought eight years was a long time for a high school graduate. Uh, what they promised, what the program entailed, you know, they would pay for four years of college. Uh, I would become a pilot and a naval officer. And uh, as it turned out, uh, later on they, uh, Relax the requirements enough that you could you could fulfill your eight years by being in the Naval Reserve. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have to stay on active duty. So I stayed on I was on active duty then for five years, and then the last three as a as a reserve. And while I was at Purdue, I flew out of Greenville uh, Naval Air Station, at 120 miles away. Mm -hmm. and it was a little as you would expect. It was a little taxing. And I forget the name of that road, but there's a road north of town that is just straight, straight as an arrow. And I was coming back one Sunday night on that road by myself, whizzing along, and 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 went went to sleep. Oh, no. And ran up, and so I just kept going straight, <laughs> and and ran over the guy in front of me. Oh. I hit him from behind. He was shook up. Man, I was shook up. I survived. Mm -hmm. Fixed the car and life went on. Right. Right. But it was, of course, as you know, it was a busy time. Right, yeah. And then two, two, one weekend out every month, I had to go up, drive up Friday night, come back Sunday night. So they, the Navy sent me for my first semester to the University of the South, which from high school to the University of the South was an experience. I mean, the instructors wore gowns. It was absolutely 100% on the honor system. When you took a test, uh, They'd put the test on the board and hand you little, the little booklets and uh, fill them out, put them, put them in my mail slot, and then leave. Hmm. And uh, small school, there were 750 students, all male, all male college. But uh, they also took seriously educating us. And uh, once a week, we had afternoon tea with an instructor. <laughs> and uh, 
many nights uh, yeah, we got invitations to come to an instructor's uh, home to, and my English instructor was, I forget his name, but he was a character. And here we are, a bunch of 17 year olds, you know, from wherever. And we started off every evening with a shot of Southern Comfort. <laughs> All gentlemen drank Southern Comfort. So, but I, we, we had some uh, animated discussions, is that what you say? Mm -hmm. After the Southern Comfort. After the Southern yeah. Comfort. <laughs> but uh, it was it 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 was a unique experience mm -hmm. to go to to the University of the South. Mm -hmm. And Ann and I dropped by there. Uh, oh, I don't know, a few years ago, and it is so changed. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping it would be still be like it was, but of course it can't. So then, after my first semester, then then they sent me to the uh, Speed Scientific School at the University of Louisville. I went two semesters there, and then uh, they had a a program that they called selective. Uh, so I mean, we were going to go into pilot training, and so. First thing they wanted to do was to find out if we could ride in an airplane without throwing up, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but uh, that's where I first sold. And my mother saved. And 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 the tradition was that when you solo, if you solo, uh, then you cut your shirt tail off and everybody signed it and you did everything. So I sent it home to my mother, and uh, when she passed on, lo and behold, there was the shirt. Aww. So Anne has it framed like that Aww. by my desk. But uh, they, they were just interested if you could manage to solo in 10 hours, and then if you did that, then you passed on. You know, you, that was a checkpoint, and you mm -hmm. went on. Mm -hmm. Then I went to Iowa Free Flight. Uh, and it was cold. That's what I most remember about. <laughs> uh, but uh, I had an easier time than a lot of a lot of the uh, students because uh, I played on the basketball team. So, uh, so I played at Iowa. Then once we got out of pre-flight, we went, I went to Corpus Christi, Texas. So it was our basic flight training. Uh, and then from there to Pensacola for our advanced training. And I played on the Pensacola team. Uh, which now, that, that was a real dream because we would fly somewhere and, and they never, I never got any uh, benefits or any excuses because I was going somewhere to run basketball. Oh. <laughs> I'd get home at two two o'clock in the morning, and I still stood on line at five thirty. So. Kind of like going home and doing your chores at ten o'clock at night, yeah, huh? Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> Boy, I was, but I survived all of that. Uh, I had my heart set on going into when going into advanced training to to fly Corsair, you know, the Corsair bird, and, and about what year is this? That's, I went well, forty six. I was in Corpus, so Pensacola. Was, I finished. I was at Pensacola 46 and 47 winter, and then then I went to Jacksonville for the advanced training, and I got my wings in June of 
48. How did your parents react to your decision not to go into farming? And you were gone for quite a while doing all these different places. How did they, how they respond to that? Uh, my mother was very, very supportive of not staying or coming to farm. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, my dad could have used the help because at that point, he still didn't have all the equipment that, right. that he had later. So, but they, they, to a large extent, they left it up to me. If that's what I wanted to do, then okay. So, then I, I got my wings in 48, served cruises on the East Coast, on the, the big carriers. Went in, went to Baffin, Baffin Bay, went inside the Arctic Circle. Mm. Uh, flew over places where buildings were on the map, not down. <laughs> <laughs> not, not much there. Yeah, especially up there. Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, yeah it was, we, uh, weather was terrible. But, you know, we, we survived. Uh, but the, the fatality rate in, in uh, for naval fighter pilots was like 5%, you know, and then you, you say, what's the chance I'm gonna make it 20 years? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that wasn't, that wasn't what uh, really, convinced me that I wanted to change careers. And that was in 49, 48, 49, before the Korean War, uh, the Defense Department was cutting back, cutting back. I, we hardly got enough gasoline to, to fly our mandatory four hours a month. I mean, it just, hmm. there was no money. That's when the Navy decided that if we'd go into the reserve, they would let us change our contract, uh, which I did. Uh, there were 50, 50, I remember it, there was 52 schools that were in the Navy program, Purdue being one. So, uh, being from Indiana, that's that was my first choice. My friends went, my best friend and his best went to Ohio State. So they were insistent I come. <laughs> uh, and so I went, I went over at uh, Ohio State and looked into going there. Uh, they were just, uh, I don't know, the atmosphere of an out-of-state student talking to the registrar in Ohio State was terrible. And when I came back, and talk to the people here at Purdue. Uh, they couldn't have been more friendly, more helpful, more understanding. And you know, when I said, oh, you know, I've taken these courses already, and et cetera, et cetera. You know, they, they would say, here's the courses you gotta take, and I'd say, but I've taken all those courses, and, and they, no problem. They just, uh, everything was so different. Uh, so I came here and uh, never looked back, I guess. Could you talk about your advisor, what you were telling me earlier? Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, um, I'm still a little nervous about his name, but I think it was Paul Stanley. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what they did for registration for each semester in those days, anyway, is that you filled out your wish list of what you wanted to do. And uh, 
then you have to go and sit down one-on-one -on -one with the advisor. And he, 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 he was tough. He said, you know, you're at Purdue. You know, damn it, you're here to learn. And no, no basket weaving courses or carpenter <laughs> shop or, you know, and so I had good grades. I, I ran about a 5-5 five, five index and so he would get me into all these advanced classes because he thought that was the thing and he was right, of course. But when I got my BS degree I lacked two math courses for a master's. So you had done quite a few advanced courses. Oh, yeah. I had done a lot of advanced courses, yeah. Mm -hmm. And as I said, I took I took rocket rocket engines from old man Zucro himself. Wow. What do you remember about him? Or he would come in well I was not necessary he was not a great instructor, by the way. He he would come in and, and start on the blackboard and write equations from side to side. And we had to copy them down because there were no copies. I mean, there weren't any books. These, this was above and beyond his book. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and he'd make mistakes, you know, on signs and what have you. So we caught on quickly, I, three of us, got together and said, okay, this, this, this time it's your time to check all these equations. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he, he, and we had a lot of Air Force uh, students, you know, that were here then in those days. They, geez, half, them, half the uh, grad students, I think, were Air Force, at least in the Aero School. Mm -hmm. And so it was tough. They 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 didn't have near the the course load that we did, but but I learned a lot. I taken tough courses. I took courses from Binder. Binder was the fluid mechanics guy. Uh, and he he was tough too. I forget the thermodynamics guy, but I, I took, I don't know, two or three extra thermodynamics, and, and then he transferred, and then then I, I I became enamored of heat transfer. I thought that was pretty neat, very analytical. Jakob was the visiting professor. Uh, he, he was he was a German Jew that got out. He actually was a full professor at IIT, but uh, some kind of professor at Purdue, and so he would come down, and he wrote two big textbooks that, at that time, were the standard in heat transfer. So I liked that, and I did well, and when I was finishing up, uh, they called me into the office and said, uh, you know, we, we have a deal for you. And I said, oh. And they said, we are going, you stay here, we'll pay you. I had already taken a job with Chance Ward. He said, we'll pay you the same money. Uh, We'll skip the master's degree. We guarantee to give you a PhD in three years, hmm. and you and you will run this uh, grant program from uh, I don't know who it was from, but it was a, was a heat transfer kind of program. Uh, I was 24, going on 25, and I said I want to go to work. They were not happy. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, what do you 
think are the most important lessons you left Purdue with? Figure it out yourself. Figure it out yourself. Don't. Uh, I remember having a discussion for, on the on the thermodynamics test, and and the guy marked my answer down because I didn't use the standard techno or you know approach that was in the book, and and I I said that's not right. You know, I figured out how to do it. I got the right answer in a very logical way. So why shouldn't I get 100% credit? He finally gave in. But, uh, but I, but I think I learned that. Uh, you know, you got to do it for yourself. Mm -hmm. I know the. My first semester, well, I took a chemistry lab, and it was not very well monitored. And I put down the answers, and, and the guy next to me said, Jet, those are wrong. <laughs> and so I said, well, uh, okay. So I changed my answers. He was wrong. Oh. <laughs> I never did that again. That's a good <laughs> lesson, too. Yeah. So, but uh, the... Aero School at that time had had a lot of the, the work was done uh, with the instructor handing you a manual and saying divide yourselves up in the groups, uh, do the work, you got any questions, and do the laboratories downstairs, you got any questions. Uh, I guarantee I'll be in my office uh, this period every day and you'll get a hundred percent priority uh, so we had to sit down and work together and figure it out mm -hmm. and that's exactly what i had to do when i went to work it's the same thing uh, but it uh, now it was i i know i was older than most of the other guys but uh, it was a, it was a good experience Purdue did well by me, no matter what I said. <laughs> <laughs> I was in uh, Tobe, uh, Tobe of I, the engineering mm -hmm. honorary. Uh, we formed a aeronautical engineering honorary, again, which doesn't exist anymore. Tobe of I still exists. I mean, they send me requests for money. <laughs> <laughs> so you so, know they're still there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I assume they're still here. Told by your pie. That was a big deal. You know, uh, in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I had thought since I had three three years of uh, playing varsity basketball, even though it was, we played, uh, what's the next level below the, I don't know, there are various classes of college basketball, and, and we played the, the, the first one down. Mm -hmm. uh, like Division Two kind of thing. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. and so, uh, I don't know how or why, I just decided that it had been a it had been a chore when I was in the Navy to play basketball all the time and keep up with everything else. And mm -hmm. I said, I, I'm going to college now. It's time to get serious. And so mm -hmm. I decided not not to even try to play basketball, whether I could have or not. Well, I probably could have because Purdue in those days had some lousy basketball. <laughs> <laughs> I just decided that that was not, yeah. Not, you know, there, there, there are uh, college athletes that, you know, get perfect grades and work and and do the athletics. Uh, I didn't think I didn't. I knew I couldn't do that, so so I didn't. So. 
the other thing, of course, the, the Navy paid everything. I went to school for free, which was nice. Uh, it was ridiculous when, when you think about it. Uh, I, had, I, I think I paid $19 a month for a room uh, with maid service. <laughs> <coughs> Food was, uh, didn't cost us a lot to eat. I was a backup uh, dishwasher at one of the sorority houses. So. Well, that was probably a good thing. Oh, that was the best, <laughs> highest painting job, highest painting job on, on, on campus. I'm sure. The, uh, yeah, but the perks were even better, huh? Being in a uh, sorority house. The <laughs> dishwashers didn't see many girls. Oh, okay. <laughs> But, uh, you know, that the uh, house mother was nice as apple pie. We got two servings at dinner, you know. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> and one at lunch, and then, then we took home the box cereal for breakfast, and milk. And so, yeah, it, you, couldn't, you couldn't make money anywhere mm -hmm. that, that would have done that. Mm -hmm. But I, I, most of the time, mine was just on the weekend because I was a sub. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyhow, so I had a I had a, a, a pretty good time here. I had a car, which was, uh, of course, helped me socially. I mean, <laughs> a lot. I had a lot of friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And of course. Uh, I was over 21, and so, although we could go to Harry's Chocolate Shop, which was mm -hmm. open then, mm -hmm. it still is, I mm -hmm. see. Uh, yeah. We would go over to Lafayette sometimes. There was a great steakhouse right on Main Street. I forget the name of it. It's our jokes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we would, we would get together a group and go over and have steaks and beer. It was not necessarily uh, an oppressing time in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna uh, shift to ask to start asking you about your career. Okay. So when you um, graduated from Purdue, your first job was with Chance Moore. Chance Moore. Chance Moore. Could you talk a little bit about the projects you worked on there and how you became in? Okay. To work like in the. Uh, I had higher paying offers, but but they were the only ones that uh, were going to allow me to be into an analytical job. I I, want, I wanted to be you know do analysis and stuff, not not to draw lines on blueprints. And uh, so I went there uh, in February. Uh, 53. By April, they had won two massive jobs. Uh, they were they were Chance Bought was a division of United Technology, and uh, the Crusader, which was to be the first supersonic fighter designed from scratch, and the Regulus II, which was a sub-launch missile, and it was the backup for Polaris. If Polaris, you know, didn't work or failed or what have you, then Regulus II would have been a uh, substitute. Uh, Polaris didn't fail. And, but anyhow, so the company suddenly had to triple in size. And which was just created a lot of opportunities. So instantly, I became a uh, subsystem engineer, which I was responsible responsible for designing, writing the specifications for things like air conditioning for the pilot, 
ram air turbines to the Crusader didn't have a battery, so if the engine failed, you had to flop out a little uh, turbine on the side and it spun up and gave you power and hydraulics and all that. Uh, what we called internal internal aerodynamics, the, the airflow inside the, the engine ducts. And getting air out out to the wings for boundary layer control and uh, we, we, we moved the air around inside the airplane. Uh, I had uh, responsibility you know above my experience level. So within four months basically you just bumped up to I just bumped up <laughs> got a humongous increase in salary and yeah. and responsibility and uh, uh, I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. We had I, the when uh, oh it, during the design fi almost final design stage of the Crusader. Uh, discovered we had to redesign the engine cooling, whole in engine cooling system. And for six weeks, we worked 84 hours a week. I mean, uh, our computer was, was, you know, punch card IBMs, uh, and we would spend hours getting the everything set up and running right. And, uh, but it worked, we got there. Uh, but that, instead of adding people, they just said work harder. Boy, that theme continues on, even today. <laughs> yeah, work harder. So, so the Crusader was a, 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 a success. And, uh, Unfortunately, that kind of left me at the end of the Crusader development that I went to Edwards Air Force Base for flight testing and all that, uh, looking for a job or, you know, another project. Uh, Chance Board had taken a subcontract from Boeing, who, who, this was like in 57. To provide the pilot enclosures and something for a man in space program. Boeing, Boeing had a big man in space program with the Air Force. So I did the, uh, went to Boeing, designed, designed a, the pilot compartment for that effort. Was that the dinosaur? Or yep, that was the dinosaur engine. That was the dinosaur program, yeah. So, but uh, it was it it was an idea before its time. I, mm -hmm. The Air Force just eventually shut it down. But it did whet my appetite for getting so, involved in space. So that's that's the first sort of that was encounter. my first first inkling of working in, in space program. Mm -hmm. So then. Uh, came back to Dallas. I designed a space simulator for Chance Moore, which they built, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, I don't know where they needed it or not. But, uh, then I decided I wanted to get involved in space hardware. So I interviewed uh, General Electric missiles in space and uh, jet propulsion lab. Uh, they both gave me kind of the same offers. So it was, do you want to live on the east coast or the west coast? Uh, we chose the east coast. So I went to work with GE uh, space. Uh, even though I had on dinosaur, I had the top secret clearance, 
uh, when I went to GE, then I was vetted and, and introduced into the black SCI world and uh, never left. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you another funny story. We got time for a funny story. Oh yeah! yeah. <laughs> I was I was testing uh, a new inlet duct that, that was an inlet duct for the engines. Okay, uh, inlet. Yeah, inlet duct, and uh, the the uh, there was a there was a great test center in in Dangerfield, Texas, which was an old. Uh, during the war, they had started to build a uh, steel mill there. They had Bessemer converters and, and had all these great compressors. And all, you know, they could put out all this air that would be needed for the steel. But of course, they decided not to do the steel. So they turned it, Mon Carmen was convinced them to turn it into a, a supersonic test center. And because there were, there were the compressors, there was all the air was there. So I'm there testing it, and uh, one in 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 when in those first, you know part of the time you didn't have anything to do. You had to wait for the technicians to get the instrumentation changed and get the test set up and everything. So I'm wandering around, and there is a J57 Pratt and Whitney engine inside an altitude chamber doing out oxygen injection for altitude, which we had been trying to get them to do for us to, to boost our, our uh, fighters to a higher altitude. And Pratt and Whitney had steadfastly said <laughs> that they were not doing any work in that area. So I came home. <laughs> Told my boss that they're, I know they're lying to us. I saw it. <laughs> so he said, okay. And he, he made arrangements to go to, to Hartford the next day to embrace them with, <laughs> with the fact that they were deceiving us. Uh, he came back a very uh, different kind of attitude. And he called me into his office, and he said, you never saw it? You don't know anything about it? Oh. Erase it from your memory. Mm -hmm. And it was, of course, they were doing work for the engines for the U-2. Oh, right. Which was, was absolutely. So, so did they accidentally allow you to see it? Oh, you mean the engine? No, it was wide open. I mean, they they were they were doing the test. Uh, you know, they they didn't tell you it was for a U two. But anything. because of your background, you knew what was going on, so that's how you challenged it. That's how we challenged okay. it. Okay, okay. And got slapped down <laughs> very hard. Uh, so uh, fortunately, one of the guys in the group knew. What was going on? And he said, oh, "Let me I'll take you to lunch." You know? <laughs> and he explained to me there were things going on that I didn't have any need to know. And that the boss was right. Just forget it. So that was my first experience on a black program. <laughs> mm -hmm. Were you still were you at GE at that point? No, I was still at James Board at that so point. So then, when you got to GE, GE, then then, then you, I was. You kind of got uh, yeah, in, you know. So. Okay. One of the reasons I wanted to go to GE is I, I had taken, you know, advanced courses at, uh, at Vought, but uh, I wanted to work in, uh, on more advanced programs, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, then I, w I was the manager, became the manager of thermodynamics for uh, the... Uh, for their black organization that, for building uh, uh, satellites. Mm -hmm. Could you explain the term black organization? Okay, the, the uh, 
the name is SCI, SCI, and, and it stands for Sensitive Compartmented Information, SCI. Uh, so, but the key word was compartmented. Uh, they, they, the, the work was absolutely just compartmented, uh, closed off to everybody else. I see. Isolated. The, you information went in, nothing came out. You know, everything. If you went to a meeting and, and took notes, then at the end of the meeting, somebody gathered up your notes and stamped them. They were classified. So, you know, in all the years I worked, we never ever had a leak. Wow, that's yeah. impressive. Yeah. People just. These are hundreds and thousands of people, right? Yeah, yeah, thousands anyway. Mm -hmm. We had a thousand. Uh, I had a thousand people working for me in in Danbury, mm -hmm. and not one of them ever leaked mm -hmm. anything out. Uh, so, anyhow, the the SCI. So, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know who started it, but somebody started calling them black programs or like black holes, you know. Right. Information just went mm -hmm. in, and, mm -hmm. and so that's when when we say mm -hmm. black programs, and the YouTube was the first black program, mm -hmm. and that broke the broke the cocoon there. <laughs> you broke the pick. code and didn't know it, huh? Yeah, I didn't know it. <laughs> yeah. So at GE. Um, was the Corona project and well, yeah, we was that but we worked on the Discover, the 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 oh. first space reconnaissance system. Then was in two parts. Corona covered the cameras, and Discoverer covered the the uh, bringing the the film back. And so GE built built the Discoverers. Because there was no digital transfer of the pictures, it was that they the film the actually a absolutely had to come back to Earth had somehow. To come back to the okay, uh, to get the re high res resolution, you know, like the lunar probe was done by Kodak, and they uh, digitally sent those signals back, but the resolution was crummy by by using high resolution film, uh, we could get good pictures. So that we, we, brought, we brought the canisters back. The Discoverer was an invention of Sinclair Scallop uh, at the GE Research Lab. And it, it was a marvelous design. I just, just uh, everybody used it. Uh, what was the key to it? The key was that the, the, of the alignment of the center of gravity and the center of pressure was such that that the vehicle always righted itself. You know, that it, no matter how it entered the atmosphere, you know, it turned itself and got itself aligned correctly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was a sphere cone uh, shape and it just worked like a charm. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, he, he had done a lot of work on uh, uh, re-entry bombs for the, <laughs> for the Air Force, but uh, that, that was his Sinclair Scallop. That was his invention. What a nice guy. So you worked on that part of the project? Yeah, I worked on the Discoverer, and then in, well, we got the first film back in August of 1960. And Eisenhower left, of course, at the end of, well, I guess in January of 61, right? And as soon as Eisenhower left, Eisenhower had, had edicted that no active military people could get involved in the black program. Why is that? 
Well, I, you know, I, I, I wondered if he was irritated at DOD, that's true, but I don't think that's why he did it. He, he wanted, the, the second caveat he put on the programs was they must have plausible deniability. In, in case something went wrong, you had to have plausible deniability. That, so he's, that was the two caveats he put down on starting the black program. He didn't want, he didn't want active military people involved. So, uh, soon, as soon as he left, then the Air Force sprung. <laughs> <laughs> the, the CIA had done the program, and the Air Force wanted to take them over. And that was, that was, that was the turf war. And what, what, the, what the Air Force did that decide they, their selling point was they, they needed space reconnaissance for tactical purposes. Whereas the CIA was doing strategic purposes. <laughs> so their first uh, effort was the Gambit program and it was a tactical intelligence program, so-called. And so I, I, I was the manager of thermodynamics then for that program, doing the space. Basically, the, the, the big problem was that Kodak built the camera and we had to keep the camera within plus or minus one degree. And which was not exactly easy to do. But, but we, we came up with a design that did that and, and, it, and it worked, worked reasonably well. And, uh, but then the, the, the electronics and everything else, we, uh, that was where we cut our teeth on how to, how to do the thermal control of satellites mm -hmm. on the gamma program. Gambit. What were the major challenges? The major the challenges were that uh, the, of course, this, the photographic satellites, you know, look at the Earth all the time. When they went around, so so the outside environment was changing. The relationship with the sun and with space, and uh, uh, that's when we came up with the with the beta program as to how to uh, launch, launch the satellites so that the, the satellite's plane had a certain angle with, with the so, solar earth line. And then, then as they went around, then uh, the outside environment didn't change as much. Mm -hmm. And it was easier. But then, so we had to come up with ways to how much solar energy to collect and how much to radiate back to space. Uh, on the gambit, we opened the door for the camera and, and then all hell broke loose because, you know, we lost a lot of energy doing that. And uh, so, but I, we saw that we got there, we got there. What was it like, um, like working in a, how did you work to solve these problems? Did you have a team? Was it how? I had a, I had a, a just an outstanding, talented team of about usually eight to eight to ten people, engineers working for me. And uh, uh, we talked about we we. It it was not a uh, strict error. Air art called alignment. We, we we were a team, as you said. We it was like, what's the problem and how are we going to solve it? Did you work under time constraints on these programs? Oh yeah. And were they in a hurry? They were. Yeah, they were always in a hurry. <laughs> but uh, uh, Gambit was more or less a success, uh, mm -hmm. I suppose. 60% of the film got ex 
explosion recovered, which wasn't bad for those days. So that was a first generation? That was the first first generation, yeah. Still back in the first generation. Corona was the, the strategic, and Gambit was the tactical reconnaissance. Uh, but you know, when, when we started Gambit, we, we had problems that, uh, like, we would take a neat picture, but it was in the wrong place, <laughs> you know, and, uh, because the, it was a framing camera, the, the Gambit, so he had a 10 mile by 10 mile uh, snapshot, and, and you know, there it's squizzing by, and how the hell do you get it to take, look at the right place <coughs> at the right time? It was not easy. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but slowly but surely, we, we figured out how to do that. And one of the things was that uh, you, you never, we, we knew that the satellite, we, we planned everything for what, where the satellite was one rev before. Because even at 82 nautical miles, to everybody's surprise, uh, we had drag. And the orbits changed, not much. But enough. But enough. To mess up a frame. <laughs> yeah, to, to mess, up, mess up the pictures, so. Uh, it was an interesting time. We, we did. We solved a lot of problems, got a lot done, and then got ready for the the next generation, generation two. Mm -hmm. And uh, smartest man I ever knew was Bud Whelan, and uh, he he to counter the Air Force's moves, uh, he established a new director in the CIA of science and technology. And, uh, so he was in the CIA, bud? He, yeah, he was the CIA. Uh, so, Les Dirks was the uh, deputy for research, a Rhodes Scholar, also a brilliant man. Uh, Les, Les has passed on. But uh, they decided that the thing to do was to uh, uh, combine the capabilities of the two sat satellites into one. So we, we would have one satellite that would be able to do search and surveillance and still take high resolution pictures. And so, and, 64, they kicked that program off, uh, and I was still a GE, uh, and uh, won the contract to, to build a spacecraft for, for Generation 2 for the Fulcrum. That was called Fulcrum. So, we worked at it, and uh, the present the reconnaissance programs now were were set up to be administered by XCOM. XCOM was the uh, sec deputy secretary of defense, and the DCI, and the president's advisor. And uh, science advisor. So, if the two protagonists couldn't agree on something, then <laughs> then the president's scientific advisor had a vote. So there was there was so uh, it worked it worked to some extent. Uh, the scientific advisor for the president's office at that time was still uh, uh, Killian president of MIT, and uh, the panel that reviewed uh, photographic satellites was uh, headed up by Den Lan, uh, you know, Den 
land or the land, <laughs> Polaroid land, uh, inventor of Polaroid. And he was a, he was a dynamic, dynamic person, to say the least. So we reviewed the Fulcrum program uh, for Land's panel. And Land had 13 or 14 national experts on his panel. I mean, he, guys that, you know, had national reputations because this is a presidential panel. But it's all secret. Is that true? Oh, yeah, it's all black. All secret. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I just want to make sure. I'm, it's yeah. hard to begin to think about how these programs work. And uh, so uh, we met in, in Boston, and uh, McCone was the keynote speaker. He was the dir director of Central Intelligence. And he told us that we were, you know, going to uh, pitch to the, the uh, next generation reconnaissance satellite. And so I handled the spacecraft and, and it went smoothly. I thought, well, that's it. So we went through the day, you know, covering everything we could, how we were going to do this. And, you know, we thought we had done a great job. I mean, <laughs> you imagine all these people who, who came and who worked their tail off to get there. So the CIA had taken a wing of the Green, Green Mountain <laughs> uh, Motel. You know, not, they took a whole wing. So yeah, I was wondering how in the world do they keep things secret when they're having these well, conferences? That, that's the way they did it. Okay. They isolated me. So we had dinner uh, in, in Lexington at the iTech plant and went back to the motel and we, we, were, we were having a good old time because we were celebrating the fact that we were going to build the next generation too. <laughs> And all of a sudden, you know, the word came in that iTech had said, no way, we do not believe that that is a viable solution. We don't think the film path is, can be done, and we will not take a contract to, to build the cameras for Fulcrum. Mm. And if you wanted to see a bunch of noisy, half-drunk people <laughs> sober up instantaneously. Yeah. Yeah. That did it. And uh, so we said, no, what, what the hell do we do now? And so... But they didn't give a reason why they thought that? They gave lots of reasons. Uh, I never... I have worried about it for... 25, 50 years, and I, I have no idea yet why they did it. Uh, the Air Force instantly gave them a contract, but I'm not sure that was. Uh, I and they and the it's, there was some truth to the fact that uh, they didn't they had not yet figured out how to do the film path. So uh, the. Uh, you know, we got together with our sponsors and, and said, what do we do now? And they said, go home. <laughs> so believe it or not, we all loaded up our cars and, and left in the middle of the night. We left Boston at midnight. Oh, my goodness. Uh, but what, what Les and uh, one of the other section chiefs at the CIA did was call up Chester Nimmons and company at Perkin Elmer and said, we want you to take over iTech's role on Fulcrum. And Chester was a very savvy CEO. And he said, well, if Kodak and iTech say it can't be done, 
we'll have to study it a little bit before we agree to do that. So they gave us, they gave Perkin Elmer uh, three months studies, a million dollars a month for study, and then extended the same thing for three more months and a million a month. And uh, they came up with an answer. And it wasn't that uh, the, the Perkin Elmer had, at that time, had more experience with uh, complicated film paths than either ITAC or Kodak. So they used their background experience and came up with an answer. And so in October of 65, now we're now into 65, uh, we briefed the land, land panel again, and, and Perkin Elmer stood up and said, not only can it be done, here's how we would do it. So, uh, ITEC also briefed them about how a different approach to, mm -hmm. to doing the same job. So the XCOM decided then in February of 66. They changed the name of the program to Hexagon and it was off and running. The uh, request for the proposal went out in May and answers in 90 months and in October Perkin Elmer got the contract to build the cameras uh, for the Hexagon program. But the booster was changed and and the program was dramatically different than full program. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so now I'm adrift at GE. <laughs> I was going to say, were you at Elmer Perkin yet? No, no. Well, I was working with him. You I were was consulting. I, I was actually, we, we had a contract from the CIA to, okay. su to, to support Perkin Elmer. Okay. Uh, to help them, and and so uh, I did the design for the, the thermal uh, system on, on Hexagon for Perkin Elmer. Uh, you know, always, it was, you know, in the black programs, remember, there was no, oh, things were just different, you know. <laughs> uh, you, you could talk, you know. Les Dirks was in charge of, pick, of choosing the right camera for hexagon, for the camera selection, the competition. Uh, I run into him in, in Los Angeles, and he says, uh, what are you doing this afternoon? And then I said, well, I don't know. What, what, what are you thinking about? And he says, I got to fly to San Francisco. Uh, I want you to come with me and um, let's talk. So, now, I'm still at GE. He's deciding whether Perkin Elmer or ITEC is going to build a camera and he wants to talk about it. And so, but you wouldn't, I mean, you wouldn't do that on an open program. No way. So, we rode up in the airplane and talked about it and I told him my text approach was flawed, seriously flawed, which I believed and still do that it was. And uh, he took that all in. I had a great relationship with, with Les. Mm -hmm. uh, we worked together then when Mexican started. Then, uh, so the CIA gave me a contract, as you say, to, to help Perkin Elmer it oriented and then in, in fact told, told me in no, kind of in no uncertain terms that they thought that my best uh, thing to do to help the program was to go to work for Perkin Elmer. And they also told Perkin Elmer that <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and Nemitz used to tell me that he said this is the only good thing the CIA ever did for him was to tell him to hire me. 
And oh, so the CIA told him to do that. Yeah. Oh, okay. And who was the head of uh, Perkin Elmer? Nimitz, you said? Nimitz. Nimitz Jr. Nimitz Jr. Boy, and, you know, lo and behold, if you didn't put the junior on the name. It'd be trouble, huh? Yeah, you'd be in trouble. <laughs> but he was a great CEO. Uh, he had spent 20 years in the Navy. In submarines. So. So he was underwater and you were in the air. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but uh, he knew he knew how to run an organization. So. So when did you start working? I went him? there in '68. Okay. Uh, just just as the just as the new facility was uh, opening. They, they had agreed, Perkin Elmer had agreed, if they won the contract, that they would build a new facility uh, to do the Hexagon program. Uh, and and they did, and it was in Danbury. So I arrived on the scene just as the facility was coming online. Uh, my first job was to, in, to, to hassle or whatever you want to call it, uh, to get the first flight article done and ready to go. And what is a flight article? What does that mean? That was the first first, first camera system. For okay, like a prototype. Okay, yeah, thing. no, it's it the real one. Okay. To get it, to get the real one. Oh, first article. I'm with you yeah. now. And to get it out and done. That was my job. Uh, you know, I, I I had talked to the owner with my wife and, and and said, it's a risky job. It could very well be a failure. Uh, and if so, then I'm down the tubes. But it could also be a success. And if it's a success, then I'm a hero. And it was a success. So, but uh, I went from that and then in 75 and uh, they made me a corporate vice president and also general manager of the hexagon skill uh, the whole facility mm -hmm. so I had I wore the two hats for, mm -hmm. for 10 years you know you mentioned your wife and it's something that always intrigues me is how do you work on these black programs and go home and not be able to share anything? Well, I had a, a very advantageous situation. Anne had been cleared. Oh. She worked at GE. Okay. And as, as an executive secretary and she had been cleared. So... She was not cleared on hexagon, but we could talk around that. So she knew what she I, understood yeah, because what of I the was clearance. Doing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But there are a lot of people that didn't know. Yeah. 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 How do you explain to your parents what you were working on? Yeah, you can't. You can't. You know. Yeah. How do you explain to your kids? You exactly. You exactly. tell them stories or whatever, but, <laughs> mm -hmm. but Daddy goes to work and Daddy comes back and yep. don't ask me what he does. <laughs> and of course then when when the flying started on Hexagon then I spent a lot of time on back and forth to Vandenberg and to uh, Sunnyvale where the satellite test center is. And, uh, uh, so when did they start flying? They first flew in June 71. June 71. So. What was it like? I mean, how, you, in, in the newspaper article, you had said something, you know, there were thousands of people that worked on this program. And what, what was it like to work the culture within the walls where everyone knew that they, you know, they just couldn't talk about well, it was it's stranger that than than you think because uh, 
what Lockheed also built a new plant to do Hexion, and and they they provided a office space for us. We had like a guy like a hundred people in the Lockheed plant in California. California. But when you met, when I met a Lockheed person that I work with every day out in the open air, we pretended we didn't know each other. Yeah, yeah. That's just so bizarre. Yeah, it is. And, you know, we, we go to Vandenberg and, uh, I forget what, but under assumed roles, uh, but there was only one motel. <laughs> and, and they knew what the hell was going on, you know. And I remember specifically we we went out for lunch and, and checked out of the hotel because we were gonna launch today. I mean that was a kind of a clue to them, you know, everybody checks out. <laughs> so the launch is today. And so it got scrubbed. I think at that, that time uh, Martin had problems. So the, the launch got scrubbed. So we said, well, let's go back to the motel and check back in. So we go back to the motel. Ah, no problem, we've checked you all back in. <laughs> so Maybe you should have gotten the hotel people on clearance, too. <laughs> but, 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 but they knew that we, you know, even though we had phony names and all that. You know. Oh, really? So you really didn't, you didn't couldn't wow. travel with your own name? No, we didn't. didn't what, what, I traveled with my name, but not my company name. Perkin Elmer was not involved in, mm -hmm. in Vandenberg. And only once in, in all of those years did we go to, I had reservations at a motel, and there were two or three of us, and go, we go to the motel. Uh, this was on the East Coast to sign in, and the owner comes out and says, no way. Uh, here comes these well-dressed people carrying briefcases <laughs> into this, this, and he he was convinced we were mafia or yeah. something, and he wouldn't, he, no way would he let us stay in his motel. Only once did that happen. Hmm. How do you think the black programs have been affected now, doing black programs now, with all the technology that's available and everything else? It's it's changed dramatically. The the in that it, it's just exploded with people. And, mm -hmm. uh, I think there's an old saying that the half-life of a bureaucratic program is, is 25 years and uh, there are so many people in, involved now and they built big, huge facilities and all of that that we didn't have. In, in the 60s and 70s, and even in the 80s, the, the black programs were run out of a hole in the wall in the Pentagon, and now they have a campus complex out on Route 28. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, just, it's just different. Uh, lots and lots and lots of people mm -hmm. that we didn't have. D tell the story that you told me regarding the satellites that you had going over Russia and what we learned from that. Well, the first, the, the first mission for the U-2 was to find out, Khrushchev has said he, you know, he had a bomb for an American city, was to, was to check out all the airfields and aircraft factories so we could come up with a, a feeling of how many how many bombers did they really have that could fly across the North Pole and, and bomb the US and the answer was, you know, a half a dozen. You know, he he greatly exaggerated. But uh, we did find very quickly that they, they were building a uh, a new launching center at Sarasagon. Uh, we didn't have a clue that, that it was being built until we got 
pictures of it. Uh, I say we, we, it was to see over the Iron Curtain, and that's what it was. The, uh, you know, there was a big uh, hollow blue when George W. Bush canceled the a ABM treaty, or opted out. Uh, we we f photographed it, you know, the that the Russians were cleared a big forest area north of Moscow. Uh, pretty soon they built roads to it. Then they built a concrete plant. Uh, they built this massive concrete structure, which was obviously phased array radar, which was absolutely specifically forbidden in the treaty. That if you wanted anti-ballistic missile defense, they had to be at the borders. Not you couldn't you couldn't put them around Moscow or places like that. So. I, I mean, the presidents knew that the Russians were cheating. Uh, but you provide the evidence. Yeah, we provided the evidence. And that's what we used to say about, Reagan would say, said that was his theme was, you know, trust but verify. <laughs> yeah. And, and we said, yeah, he provides the trust, we do the verification. Yeah, and you said you firmly believe that your people knew more of geography of Russia than they did of our own country. Oh, yeah. See, I, I signed in a uh, statement every year from the dear old CIA that swore and affirmed that I would never allow it to be targeted on anybody or any place or in the United States. So. Oh. The, the cameras. The cameras, yeah. We never targeted the but, so yeah, I think we knew more about the Sino-Soviet bloc by far than we knew about the United States. Hmm. That's interesting, and you know, today yeah. that's that's the hot topic, right? Surveillance, yeah. domestic mm -hmm. versus, mm -hmm. yep. things have changed. And so he was doing it way back then. But uh, And you firmly believe that probably helped to, to end the Cold War. Oh yeah, yeah, because we knew. From you provided the evidence. Yeah, yeah from 85 on, uh, it was obvious that the, the Russians were, they was just falling apart. Things were not happening. And, and uh, we had really, out, you know, pushed them to the point of no return. So. Do you think the, the new drone activity would replace some of your satellites, or do you think they're two separate things? I, I think they're separate things. The dr drones are nice for quick looks at, and and you know, in the in the uh, Mid East wars, the Israel wars, and what have you, used the used uh, not only the U twos but the SR seventy ones, uh, because if you you could do it now for a satellite, you gotta wait. Mm -hmm. Mm. Till it comes. Uh, mm -hmm. So they they were nice. I don't know auxiliaries for the satellites, but you know they just. Uh, I was just covered everything. One of the missions, the mission statement for Hexagon was that. No photograph of an urban area of the Sino-Soviet bloc would be more than six months old. Hmm. I mean, no, you know, six months. And no photograph of the non-urban areas would be more than a year old. So, and that was 14 million nautical miles squared. Wow. So why did we have a lot of film? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of area. We had a lot of area to cover. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was, uh, but anyhow, it was. Uh, believe it or not, it was fun. I, we 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 knew we were doing something that was important. Yeah. Now, where where does this film exist now? 
the National Photographic Interpretation Center oh. in, in Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. It's, it's in the old Navy Yard. Mm-hmm. And that, that's where it's analyzed and s- stored, mm-hmm. put in canisters, indexed. A lot of it now is it has been digitized, but mm-hmm. uh, still, I'm sure those cans are still there. <laughs> well, we're we're getting close to our lunch time. Oh, okay. Well, I, I, I know I talked when, too much. When did you actually retire, though? I retired in in '86. But was it from Perkin, or from did you per- move? No, from Perkin Elmer. Okay. Then I went to Washington then as the uh, supply system engineering technical assistance to the CIA program. What was that again? The what? CETAS, S-E-T-A, system engineering technical assistance. Okay, to the CIA, okay. And I did that for 10 years. I wanted to ask you, um, from these programs, there were advances in technology that were used in civilian application that you worked on, like the Hubble, I guess, but also, uh, if you could say a few words about that, but also, I mean, it seems to me that you were doing things for the first time that became applicable to other areas. Could you talk a bit about that? Well, yeah, we... uh, the, the technology that we developed for uh, polishing uh, flimsy mirrors, uh, we developed Perkin Elmer in 84 or 85. 80% of all the integrated circuits in this com- made in this country were made on Perkin Elmer equipment. And that, that equipment was a a direct result of work that we had done on black program. Really? And what were those, can you give us some examples of what those circuits are in? Everywhere. Everywhere? Everywhere. I mean, the, uh, then, uh, of course, as, as things advanced, then the, the using the microline equipment uh, got bypassed and other mm-hmm. people built it. Uh, particularly the Japanese. But uh, the microline was that. Uh, that was a direct result of, of the work we did. Uh, but I, you know, for the, the Air Forces, uh, Albuquerque, uh, you know, they, they picked up our work and how to polish and, and particularly coat electronics or not electronics but the optical surfaces. Mm-hmm. So that's still military. Uh, what went into the civilian world was was mostly the uh, ability to make the integrated circuits. Uh, we also uh, worked with. We, we, we were the center of uh, computer technology at, at Perkin Elmer. We got into, com- got into trouble with that. Uh, then they took that computer expertise and made that into computer-aided uh, chemistry. In the olden days, you took an analytical instrument and you took a spectrograph of, of a sample, and then some PhD sat down and looked at the lines and everything <laughs> and figured it all out. And it would take him a week, you know, to analyze the sample. Well, uh, we did that with computers. So, sorry for the PhDs, but you know, a technician could could do a better job and in a couple hours than he could do in a week. Uh, That was a great boon to making analytical instruments. Uh, uh, And 
and that that was a big part. That was there were three parts of Birkin Elmer then: the analytical instruments, the microlines, and the, the hexagon, the government blackboard. But Nimitz made one fatal mistake, and that was he, he did not provide for succession of what was the, how the company could survive when they left. Uh, that was the demise, huh? That was the demise. The marketing guys took it over. All the board of directors were the same age as, as Nimitz, and so. They all left at the same time, and uh, so a, a new group of people came in and took it over and didn't know what the hell they were doing, and went down the tubes quickly, broke it all up, sold the parts. United Technologies took up a small world, they now own the, mm -hmm. the Hexagon plant in Danbury. <laughs> But I had a good career. I knew, uh, you know, I could have made a lot more money and done other things. But I mean, designing cameras for space versus building buildings or something was just th there was no comparison. Mm -hmm. I got to do what I really wanted to do, and that, that's probably rare these days. Yeah. It's important. Yeah. But how did how did you migrate away from your love of heat transfer technology to the building of the cameras? Did that kind but of just evolve? Because one of, no, that evolved because one of the big stumbling blocks in, in building the cameras was was heat transfer. Okay, so there you had it. Okay, yeah, so okay, that's the connection. That uh, somewhere, someplace, I was recognized as a pioneer of space reconnaissance. Mm -hmm. But that was because of the work I did for for the thermal control. Mm -hmm. How how do you put a camera out in space and that's designed to operate at seventy plus or minus one degree mm -hmm. and, and do it? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, so, no, heat, heat transfer thermodynamics was my core, mm -hmm. although I was an aeronautical engineer, I, that was my core expertise, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you get right yeah, down. Yeah, but I see the connection now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and the Hubble, you know, the Hubble was something we did on the side. but. But what made it easy for us to do the Hubble is because we had this fantastic facility and all this equipment and everything. And uh, by 1977, uh, we weren't using it full time. And uh, people told us, you're crazy, the NASA, <laughs> NASA and the CIA and the National Reconnaissance Office will never agree to let you do uh, NASA program in in this facility, but we ask, and, and finally they said, "Yeah, it makes sense," and they, and they let us do it. That's wonderful. I mean, the Hubble telescope has affected so many people. You oh know, yeah, yeah. You know, just opened our eyes to the universe. And and you know, then we made one one glaring mistake. Which was corrected, but the uh, we we you know as part of the get-in story, we told NASA we will develop the inter interferometric equipment on our own dime, you know, and bring it to the program, and you won't have to pay for it and all that. And they said, "Oh, that's great! So <laughs> here they're getting something for free, right?" So we did build it. And we did test it, and as far as we knew, it was good. But what happened was we transferred a very special piece of equipment from a research lab 
onto a program without going through all the quality control steps one should have gone through. And, you know, it's easy to say now, how in the hell could you have let that happen? Uh, I don't know, we didn't think about it, I guess. Didn't, didn't realize there was a problem, and, and it turned out that there was a problem, and, and, the, and, and the mayor wouldn't focus because we had rolled the edges. So we could have fixed it, had we? And, and so we, we had a, our chief scientists, and some, some people inside the company felt that something was wrong. Because when we tried to align the secondary and the primary, they didn't, they didn't, didn't work right. So now the question was, NASA has already told the world that the primary mirror is the best mirror ever made. <laughs> uh, and it's, that was true. Happened to be to the wrong figure, but... <laughs> so now are we going to go and fix it or just keep going and hope? that the new guys are wrong, that the old guys are right. Because uh, there, was, there was two sides of the equation, two, two groups of uh, talented people, one saying it was, uh, it was okay, and one saying you, you, you better check it. Well, to check it, we would have had to strip the coating off the mirror and put it back in the chambers and, and measure it. Uh, Diff with a different way, using a different technique to measure. Uh, it would have set the program back six months. So NASA and their infinite wisdom uh, told us to shut up and get on, get on with it. <laughs> we did, and so then we put the first, when it flew, couldn't focus. Well, I, that's that. To say it couldn't focus, it it didn't have the focus that it should have had, and so the spectrograph people didn't care. I mean, if you're going to run spectrographs, all you want to do is just collect energy. You don't mm -hmm. you don't need pictures or anything. You just collect the energy, and so uh, they were happy. They got a lot of <laughs> they got a lot of observing time. So then they made made, made a correction. So focus the mirror and that, uh, or to focus uh, on that focus and that, uh, uh, that worked and the, and the fixtures have been great ever since. Yeah. It was supposed to last 15 years, uh, 205 was the end date and we're now eight years beyond that. What are, still what are the plans? Any? No, they Any just plans? No, nope, they just the uh, they oh. have decided that they will not make any. The gyros are the weak uh, link in the chain, uh, and if they go, they go. Well, so. is there any question that I haven't asked you that you wish I had asked? that Rita and I had asked you. And then we'll <laughs> thank you very much and wrap it up. And okay. Uh, I don't know. I guess the question that I often got asked was, uh, why do you do this? And, you know, hide, hide your capabilities under a under a bushel or basket, like it says in the Bible. And had you gone out and worked in in the open world or whatever, you could have you could have done so many bigger, better, greater things. And I don't really have an answer except I knew I was doing what I love to do, and I didn't care if I could have made more money. I got paid reasonably well, you know. I, uh, you visited our home. We, 
did you or did you? No, we met at, at the uh, little community center. Oh, okay. Jill came to the house. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, you have a nice life, enough money to get by. Yeah, I could have done more money and what have you, but, and I saw people do it. Uh, I probably thought about it for two minutes and said, wasn't for you. It wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. So I had that rare career where the, my work was what I loved to do. So then it wasn't work. Yeah, then that was <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah, the uh, lots of people have told me during my lifetime that uh, that I was very intelligent. Uh, you know, I just let it roll off my back. That was so. That wasn't so, who you were. No, the. the uh, I took a standardized test at dear old Purdue one time uh, in the mechanical engineering department, a department test. I was the only person in the whole group that solved the problem. And I forget the instructor. He was impressed. <laughs> so they threw the out, they gave me gave me credit for it, so I made over a hundred on the <laughs> on the test. But he told me more than once, and other people, that that I was a smart person. And Emmett's always said that I was the smartest person that he had, mm -hmm. uh, and that it was the only favor the CIA ever did with me. <laughs> <laughs> was in essence encouraging me to come, yeah. to come there. Well, we're so grateful for you sharing your story with yes, us. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, but you know, in my class here, I was third. I was not the first person. The class at Purdue? The class at Purdue. Even third? Yeah. That's, that's, that's fabulous. That's pretty good. <laughs> well, but I, the, the, Vern Eklund and Dave Bowditch were really smarter. But neither one of them had anything like the career I had. Mm -hmm. Dave went to work for NASA. And I don't know, just bogged down. Vern went to work for Pratt & Whitney's nuclear lab. And I'm sure they did great work, but. Yours was rewarding and exciting yeah. <laughs> and secret. Yeah. And, and very secret. Yeah. So how many, well, before we end, uh -huh. how many other black programs are you still have to keep secure? Are there others that you still can talk about later? I Somebody told me that uh, when they cleaned my file that I had 25 accesses. Uh, some of them important, some not. Some will never be clear. Uh, for instance, on Hexagon, the, the, how well we did the making maps is still classified. Probably won't ever be clear. Okay. Uh, but the really sensitive work that the CIA did was work that impacted other countries. Right. I mean, if, if they were putting installations in other countries, yeah, yeah. Then, then the, those are very closely held. Mm -hmm. So. Interesting. Yeah, no, I had a lot of things. Took a lot of polygraphs. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't make you take one today. No, no. <laughs> no, no, no. The, uh, yeah. The, uh, and I used to, that used to be my, my, my party line was that you can ask any question you want. If I know the answer, I'll tell you. And if I don't know the answer, I'll make something up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, probably could have gotten gotten away with it very easily. 
but I was not a, uh, I was a hand-on engineering manager. You know, I, mean, I understood what was going on. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Well, I don't know where that's what you expected.